So hello everybody, it's James from Posse Stars. Thanks so much for coming back. Today we're revisiting Lorna Taylor, who is a physiotherapist who works with schools, teachers and children. And today we're going to be talking about children's posture. Hello Lorna. Hi James, thanks for having me on again. Thanks so much for coming on again. Your last podcast with us was absolutely fantastic, talking about teachers' posture. And today we're going to talk about just as relevant children's kids kids' posture. There's a lot to talk about. What's going on in the world of kids' posture, Lorna? A whole heap of things is going on with kids' posture right now, James. I'm sure any parents will be familiar with uh, online learning that we've had at home with kids hunched over screens, whether that be a mobile phone, an iPad or laptop device. Uh, we're more familiar, I think, right now with kids' posture. But it goes way back to when we um, are, are born, really, our development of our spinal curves and our posture in terms of lying on the floor, learning to roll, to crawl, to sit, pulling up into standing and then walking. So posture development in kids starts from day one. And it's something we definitely need to be thinking about from day one especially nowadays with everybody um, we've got a lot of lockdowns going on we're in the middle of the, the whole covid lockdown situation i remember back to when i was a kid in 1827 um, we used to run around the fields with fishing nets and sticks hitting each other and, and generally climbing trees and falling down ditches uh, whereas nowadays i guess a lot of these children are sat in front of screens and not getting the movement that you're talking about yeah you're spot on there i think it's several reasons i think Personally, as a parent, I felt socially that can I really let my children of eight or nine go out to the park without a parent um, for fear of something happening? You obviously newspaper stories of, of, of terrible things that are going to happen, which are so incredibly rare, but it's always brought to the forefront of our mind. And I think we are perhaps more risk adverse as parents and the children are being less exposed to adventurous play, we call it risky play. And we need that play to develop up an awareness of ourselves and our sense of risk and our sense of danger. And if we're protected from it all of the time, we firstly aren't developing that awareness and understanding of our own bodies. But secondly, we're not developing our sense of is it okay to do this and and and, and or and is it is it not and you sometimes think you know kids crossing the road if they've not been exposed to that before to do that safely how are they gonna learn to do that so it's a difficult balance but I think as a society we have reined our kids a lot more in and when you add technology and addictive games into that mix we've got a really growing problem with our young people. Yeah, I agree. So we've got a, co a couple of things you're mentioning there is in, t in developmental terms, there's the physical developments that comes with um, those exaggerated movements that come with play and the cognitive development that comes with um, the risk associated with, uh, with that play. And then we're just starting to talk about gamification and gamification of healthcare, particularly for children. But the issue with that is that these screens can be very addictive in terms of screen time. So how do you manage enjoying gamifying healthcare with your children at the same time as getting them away from those screens? What's the answer? It's difficult, isn't it? Because the, the apps we'll be familiar with with Pokemon Go, which, yes, are great to get kids more active. And I know children that have walked miles with family that never would have done before or kids going out in the rain. So, yeah, there are benefits in terms of activity there. But then when they're going out, they're looking over a screen. It's not entirely safe. You've still got risks to eye health that is not really touched on too much either when children are looking at screens. So I think it is about balance, but ultimately it's it's a really difficult job being a parent. It's a really difficult role growing up as well. And I think it always is about choosing your battles, isn't it? And also trying to instill healthy habits within children. So even if you can do simple but really impactful things, for example, not having screens at the dinner table, that's something we can all do and have more sort of engaging type conversations and just know that that time's protected. You can 
disconnect Wi-Fi and things around bedtimes. There's a lot around screen time before going to bed. And um, I think for me, I'm probably more concerned about the sleep disruption and phones in bedrooms. If you're then looking at texts and kids going on social media and playing games at like two, three in the morning, I think that's probably more of an issue than going on your phone near a bed. I don't know. It's just something I believe. So maybe charging phones up downstairs, things like that. Trying to look for the small wins, set screen time limits. Maybe can you do that with your kids? You each set a limit because they are quite good, the kids that are coming back and saying, well, you do it. Um, so, yeah, maybe looking at little goals you can do together. Um, invariably, when children, certainly teens, are off their phones a bit, they do say that they're glad they've uh, restricted their use a bit. They do feel better for it. But it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's got, it's got to be a good balance, hasn't it? We can't turn around and be Luddites and just say, well, there's no screens um, because they're going to grow up in a world which is probably all screens or, yeah. or some sort of virtual reality. And it, it is phenomenal what they are learning as well. Some of the social media apps and they can cook various creations. They can make certain things. So it, it does bring a sense of creativity as well. It's, it is. It's like everything in life. It's a balance. They can do all these things well, but they can't go on podcasts and say, oh, when I was a kid, we used to do this. <laughs> they can't do that, Lorna. You actually should get some kids on a podcast, shouldn't you? That would be a good thing. I think that would be a great thing. We could we could talk about um, the pleasures and pains of growing up as a, as a kid in, re- in relation to, to posture. Especially Let's, a kid of a physio. <laughs> especially a kid of a physio. As an Alexander Technique teacher and a posture specialist and ergonomics type person, I I'm often asked what I do about my kids' posture. And I wanted to mention that because I have to answer the same every time. And what I say is that I had a friend um, and his father was a psychotherapist and his father used to do psychotherapy on him. And I think that was probably something he didn't appreciate. And so for my kids, I don't I don't chastise them about their posture, but I do try and make sure that the environment is available as best it can be for them so that developmentally they've got the best opportunities without their parents constantly nagging them about their posture, which which I would be liable for um, really falling out with my kids over if I did that. So let's talk briefly about developmental postural issues associated with sedentary child's behavior what what effect does it have on them physically so from from day one as we were saying earlier if kids are not exposed to playing on the floor and just learning that sense of self and reaching for objects to focus eyes and make the neural connections in their brain for the next stage of development that that will have knock-on impacts all the way along so it's incredibly important that kids are just be able to just play just be on the floor it's become a lot more difficult with people having wooden floors because it it is harder to crawl and move on a wooden floor it's more slippy so um, kids are being exposed less to this really essential base building block Um, kids often are in safe car seats and push chairs yes we do need safe car seats but they can click now into push chairs so kids are just not exposed to being on the floor so that it's essential that we we, we just let them play, let them be, let them develop so they can build up their core strength and their, their muscles for the next stage. Because actually, once you get to walk in and when you start to carry in bags and sitting in classrooms, it's quite hard work. And if we haven't developed the sort of core strength, it then makes it, you fatigue more. So you'll then probably slump more. You're less active with your learning. So sort of oxygenation to your brain is compromised if you're slumped over. It's difficult to write and use fine motor control. So it's that active base at the start of in early childhood and movement it is key to set kids up for the future. And that's when we can then start looking at equipment and furniture and workstation set up to support them further. When I bought a sit-stand desk, I, I went the whole hog and I went extra to get one that goes really low so that my kids can sit and do homework at it with me a lot of people don't get that opportunity and their kids are doing homework on the kitchen table which is normally 73 centimeters high on a kitchen chair which is normally too low even for an adult to rest their arms comfortably and write or to use a laptop are we missing the boat in terms of 
children's posture for homework? I think you're you think you're right in what you're saying. Um, we must be very respectful and mindful of people's home working environments. Um, they're often shared spaces, as you say, but there are very some simple things you can do um, to improve your kids' setup at home. And it can be like putting a, a cushion, a wedge cushion, on the seat so their hips are sort of, sort of tip forward, their knees are slightly lower than the hips, so they're having a natural, more upright posture. Uh, a rolled up towel or um, even socks filled with with tights to make a, a lumbar roll as it were so just to roll up and pop in the the base of your back and if feet aren't touching the floor just a box or yeah, I think a lot of us have had a few home deliveries so uh, just a simple box under your feet so you've got contact with the floor and your legs aren't swinging and just getting them up moving simple investments could be a laptop uh, a separate keyboard and a mouse for a laptop you know make a make a laptop riser just if you've got any bits of wood at home use use a box again but try and get the laptop at eye level and I think if the one piece of advice we could give our kids as they move progressively through this world of technology and are never going to be far from a laptop I feel um, just to think about that laptop height because I think if we can get that bit right you will then find that you can sort the, the, the seating um, out more easily. So that probably would be one, my one bit of advice, um, if you can only do one thing. But yeah, it's a combination, as you know. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I like the idea of um, getting them sat comfortably. And to do that in most of our household chairs, they do need that support for their feet. It's really yeah. important. It just helps them sit better. And then in relation to that, getting the, the screen in front of them, I have to admit, because the laptop um, at home serves two purposes. Um, firstly, I'm recording this podcast on it. And then secondly, it also goes off as a, a homework machine for the kids. So when they're only doing 10 or 15 minutes homework, it doesn't always get connected to an external yeah. keyboard and mouse, which is heresy, which is absolute <laughs> well, terrible. Well, I think for 10, 15 minutes, I think the key is, isn't it, that regular moving of position. Yeah, you, they say, don't you, your, your next posture, your best posture is always your next posture. Just keep moving. So 10, 15 minutes is fine. I think for the older kids that, although they're not doing exams necessarily this year, but just so many tests in replacement, it oh, seems know. that that's maybe they can set a time on their phone. Like every half an hour, they they stop, they stand up, they stare at sort of twenty meters in the distance for twenty seconds just to yeah. try and uh, relax their eyes as well and, and, and blink tightly. So yeah, just the the factors that we'd think about in the office workplace and for adults are just as important for for children. I agree. It's exactly the same thing for adults for for children. Mm. Um, I'm I'm reminded of um, Alan Hedges. Hedges three S's as they're called, Professor Alan Hedge was recommending um, for every 20 minutes sitting, we stand for eight and then stretch and move around for two. I think that works quite well with kids as well because I notice after about 20 minutes, the kids start to get a bit fidgety and a, and, and a, a bit fed up. So A bit restless. I think as well, a bit restless. fidgeting in um, schools, you know, probably yeah. a, a real bugbear of saying to children, don't fidget. Well, actually, they're needing to adjust their position. If yeah, they're fidgeting they them sat for too long, yeah, let them stand up. And, and coming back to schools as well, I, I find it heartbreaking that actually, as a punishment, breaks are cancelled or PE or PE as not seen as as important as maths and English and is sometimes dropped from, uh, dropped from the day. So I think in education uh, around teaching at uh, the importance of movement for our future workers and the health of our children is it would be a great thing. It just seems at the moment that it's sit still, ignore your body, ignore its discomfort and learn so that you can go out and be an effective, productive worker later in yeah. life. And yeah. what, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're taking an orange and um, bruising it really badly and then trying to sell it on the shop shelf. Yeah, yeah. Is that highly that, functioning orange? Yeah. It's a, it's a worse analogy ever, but on no, the spot, that's the it, best one I can come up with. It, it, it does. It makes sense. And I think the thing is, there's just so much opportunity. There's so much opportunity we can do simply to improve our kids' posture and our their sense of well-being, because posture is all about how we feel, how we carry ourselves. And 
if COVID has taught us nothing, it's taught us that well-being is really important and it's linked to our mental health. So it's it's a, actually quite an easy, quick win for schools, I believe, to improve not only health, but learning outcomes for children yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Get get those kids active and moving and their learning outcomes. There's been so yeah. many studies on and, this. And that... get them set up with with improved furniture and you, you, teachers are probably familiar when children try and tip forward on their chair and it's like, oh, so, you know, put your, get all four legs on the chair. But actually they're just trying to create that, that wedge, that tip forward to actually sit more upright, more actively, more engaged. So let's talk about that. A good thing. As, as a kid, I went to uh, a school and we had these desks that were a sort of all-in-one pew desk combo that the lid would rise. There's probably a special name for it. And that desk was my desk from the age of 11 until the age of 18. How could that desk have fitted me? Yeah, I, I don't know. Unless you didn't grow in height between 11 and 18. <laughs> I'm, but... I'm still four foot one as a result of my schooling. <laughs> yeah, I blame the desk. Yeah. Yeah, I I guess it, it, it probably wouldn't have done, but maybe you were moved out of position or so, or maybe you were generally quite fit and active as a kid and you could tolerate those positions a little bit more. Or maybe you did have excruciating back pain and that's now why you're in that Well, in, in, in later life I did, and that's why I've, I've yeah. trained in, in healthcare, yeah. To, uh, to that school, I apologise for my initials carved all over that desk. <laughs> <laughs> you're a marked man james you're yeah. a marked man i am a marked man as, as well as that they probably think william shakespeare was there at the same time i apologize <laughs> for that as as well i'm guessing school wasn't your favorite place to be fair i had i did have a lovely time at school although a lot of the people i went to school with didn't it it was a boys school it was a grammar mm-hmm. school so um i i flourished in that environment because i've always been quite confident and got on well with people and didn't take offense uh, for a lot of people they found it a lot more difficult and, and look back a lot less fondly on on their times yeah. yeah school has a big impact on our life doesn't it yeah i don't know anyone that won't have been impacted somehow from their schooling i guess it's it's there to do a job to impact us or from their university, 30 years after university, once or twice a month, I still wake up trying to find the exam room that I haven't got the directions for, <laughs> that I haven't revised for. And that was 30 years ago. Yeah, my, I, my I've not had those for a while, but I do remember having those for quite a while after graduating. That suddenly panic, waking up in the middle of the night, you've got an exam. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm glad those days are behind me. I still get the noun again, but I'm okay. I'm not. I'm not that. <laughs> You're not too traumatized. I'll. I'll survive. I'll bury it. I'll bury the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but what? Getting back onto posture, what we can't bury is the postural problems that are resulting out of kids at the moment having homework at home and being kept away from movement, and then when they go back to school, something I suspect is going to change quite rapidly because well-being is in the spotlight now as as a result of COVID-19. Most companies and hopefully the education system are turning around and saying, oh my Lord, the well-being of our staff has been vastly overlooked and underrated. Mm -hmm. And if people are going to be happy and healthy and productive, most importantly for the companies and for the schools, they need to be looked after. They need to be cherished and not sat in one size fits all desks and chairs for eight years of of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more coming out about school design, actually, and um, making learning and working environments more active and integrating. You know, I've seen one school, it's it's in Denmark, I think. It's not sure how well it'd be embraced here, but hopefully one day where rather than the stairs, they've got a a separate slide so you can slide down rather than just use the stairs, which I thought just bringing that fun element in and sort of climbing walls with on on the wall with mats underneath. So just giving kids an opportunity to like explore and express themselves and be active within the constraints of of the, the learning day. That sounds amazing. I wonder if that's a peculiarly European thing, whether in Britain we just use the slide to get them from class to class quicker and save, se- <laughs> shave seven seconds off the, the transition you from one class to another. You peak at the bottom, so you shoot down and you're ready for being ready <laughs> for the next thing. Yeah, straight yeah. straight into those shorts it's, and trainers. It's a, tough, it's a tough job being a teacher and I, 
Yeah, I think the again opportunity for improving teacher training because I do think it's perhaps more teachers and school leaders are not so aware of the importance of kids' posture and posture for themselves as to why they're not embracing it more. Maybe it is a, an understanding issue rather than just not wanting to do it. So I think yeah. teacher training can can be improved looking well, at let's, working and learning environments. Let's answer those questions then. If it is an understanding and an awareness thing, let's let's go through our three questions, slightly slightly tailored, Lorna Taylor, for today's <laughs> posture. <Very fun. laughs> which is ha oh, which is um question one is what is kids' posture? Yeah, I think for kids posture it's similarly with adults. Um, but I think for children it's gonna be more about gross motor development and how we are developing our posture in terms of muscle strength, flexibility, our coordination, our activities where we cross the midline of our body. So getting two hemispheres of our brain working together. So I think for me, there's more involved and it's posture and gross motor development in children rather than just for adults. Yeah. So it's it's um, when we think about children's posture, we're not thinking about a position. We're thinking about the whole yeah. development, the developmental sphere of moving into fully grown organisms. Yes, that, that development of a, of a being. <laughs> that said, then, how uh, how do you help children's posture? How, how can we help children's posture? And as a third question, what can parents do and teachers do to support that? Yeah. Two questions in one. So as a children's physio, I'm really passionate about early childhood development and in terms of activity to support the cognitive learning as as, as well as the gross motor development and that sense of wanting to explore and wanting to take ownership for your own health. I think we've got a huge place and role we can play in early childhood development. So I think that's something we can do both as parents and teachers and, and although you can want to do nothing more than take your kids to the park after a busy day. It, it is time so well invested, even if you've got a garden to go out, set up an obstacle course at home, have fun moving because if kids enjoy stuff, they will want to do it more so. And we all know that good habits are formed early on. So if we can instill that sense of wanting to move, wanting to be active when our kids are young, then we are setting them up for a, you know, a much better future. So that's something we can all do and from schools as well. And then leading on we are more from the early years, uh, thinking of primary age children, again, coming back to movement, looking at active travel going to school, looking at uh, nutrition. Obviously, if we are overweight, we're going to have more stress and strain on our joints. It's then harder to move and you feel less comfortable when you're hot and puffing and you're struggling to keep up with your friends. So good nutrition at home is really important and, and that is possible on, in, on, bud, on all sorts of budgets so sensible eating at home and school will also help and then moving it more so into secondary when kids are more sedentary and they're having longer periods of time on computers looking at their furniture and their workstation setup as we would with adults so looking at their desk chair combo looking at height of screens you know any apps you can time time apps to limit your screen time, ones that you can plot, hydration, for example. So using the adjuncts available to support you, because there's lots out there now. There are thousands of companies who are poised and ready to help school children, and we just need the education system to give it the thumbs up and say, yeah, we're going to invest in our kids and and look after them. Yeah, and understand it. I still think we're trying to, not necessarily sell is the right, not the right word, is it? But we're trying to share our passion with people that still aren't fully aware of why they need to do it or understand why. But I think as there's more education within schools and within families, actually, yeah, there's some really simple things you can do that can make a big impact. I think we'll have a greater take up and belief in what we're trying to do. I, I really hope so. In industry now, the um, the financial side of industry is is drilling down into wellness and seeing it as an opportunity rather than an expense. Mm. I, I just feel that maybe on education, they're lagging behind that somehow and not seeing it as an opportunity. Yeah. And I think it would be brilliant to have some research looking at teacher health and well-being on impact in children's outcomes, because we know office workers are more productive. Well, actually, if you've got teachers that are more productive, the, the, the product, the service offered by schools, the product is a kid's 
future, essentially. Mm. And if that can be impacted, as it were, other outputs for organisations, that, that's, that's huge. And maybe if schools thought or kids thought, actually, if I've looked after my health and well-being, I've had that instilled in me, I know how to keep myself healthy, safe and well, and I can be earning an extra 10 grand a year because of it, I think that's when people will be more interested. But that is data we're never likely to get in the near future. But if you compare other studies, I think it's schools have got a huge opportunity to really could, have a great impact. I think so. You could look at um, you could look at a child's lifetime as a tree, and if you've got a tiny little sapling and you chop a little branch off and break it in half here or there, that affects the whole of the growth of the tree for the next 80, 90 years. Whereas if you take an 80 or 90 year old tree and snap a twig off at the top, then you haven't really made that much difference. No. So it's, no. And coming back to your thing as well about giving advice to your kids, I, I wouldn't as a physio sort of be saying, oh, you need to sit up straight and oh, watch when you're bending down like that. But I do like to think I've exposed my kids to risk. And although that is a bit scary as a parent, you know, we've, We've let them walk along the top of a wall with a handheld, you know. One of them has fallen off the top of a kid's slide and broken an arm. And yes, you feel totally awful, but we assess that risk as safe. But she, you know, dressed as Cinderella, I think the tights were a bit slippy to be standing at the top of a slide. But she then, no, let them climb up a slide if it's safe, people aren't coming down, you know. Have that confidence to assess that risk. And yeah, they are fortunately very aware of things now you never know in the in what's going to happen in the future but just em- embrace it and, and go with it and give them those experiences because they're fun as much as anything else you've you've inspired me Lorna um I'm going to close off our podcast now I'm going to <laughs> take my children out into the garden and I'm going to balance, them, balance them on around. top of a really narrow yeah. brick wall or something <laughs> And throw balls at them and see get how them up a tree get them rolling down a big grass bank you know even that, I was running with our middle one the other day we went and did an off-road run and there was a massive hill she's like can I roll down it she'll be 17 this year yes so. <laughs> <laughs> just I, I avoid suspect, the sheep poo <laughs> just avoid the sheep poo thinks the parents <laughs> uh, alright yeah, everybody just embrace it <laughs> embrace it you, you heard it here our best advice for kids posture is to get them moving and get them away from those screens or at least use those screens um, sensibly and have break times away from them so without with that all that said i am going to go out and play in my garden everybody thank you for listening thank you lorna thank you